Hello, this is Silas. We're back for the Dishing on Dish series, continuing the Dishing on Dish series. And I always do these intros in different ways. Like I'm sitting, mm-hmm. sitting here talking to Steven at the start, then we get to the one, two, three, and start, and it's always different. Anyway, mm-hmm. but the <laughs> stuff that's not different is this is a series about talking about food. It's part of a subsection of the You Are What You Consume series, specifically Dishing on Dish. Steven, and then eventually other people will be just focusing on certain foods and dishes that they've had at certain places. And uh, with this one, it's a bit special towards special compared to the other ones we've done because this is a restaurant that Stephen actually worked at, and I'm just going to kick it over to him, and you can tell us a bit more about what we're talking about today. Good afternoon, everyone. Hope you're well. Today we're going to begin part three of our discussion of seasonal restaurant and vine bar. It was a Michelin starred Austrian restaurant that I worked at from about summer of 2010 to about summer of 2011. So it'd be my second job in New York City here. Uh, I had a lot of fun there. A very found a lot of inspiration working there. Unfortunately, it's no longer with us. We can, if you're more familiar, if you want to learn more about the restaurant's history, we, I recommend watching part one if you haven't already. But yeah, we're just going to pick up where we left off as far as presenting the dishes and discussing what's in them. Yeah. So with the You Are What You Consume series, this is a series where we're just focusing on the things that you consume. So uh, human beings, creatures, animals, plants, all these things take in other material and then converts them into their actual physical being. Like it breaks things down and builds them up into other things. But one thing that's different with humans is the cuisine, is the thoughts, is the ideas, is the creative aspect that goes in. And with Dishing on Dish, we try to highlight that. Some of the URL you consume is just talking about general things, but this is specifically talking about the foods. So we do more of a deep dive, do a, a plate per plate by plate, dish by dish. Uh, Stephen has a lot of information mm. and a lot of knowledge about the different things that he's eating, and we'll be welcoming other people to come in with the knowledge. It doesn't have to be completely in depth. <laughs> I think some people might probably hear some of the stuff Stephen th- says and then think, okay, let's not get into that because. But he's been in the food service industry. Mm. It's something that he has a. a that's it's, it's been always said someone has a passion for something, but it's something he cares about, something he researches, and something he looks into, and he gives us a lot of really good insight into it. And as he mentioned, this is a restaurant that he worked at. Mm. It's a fusion of Austrian and German, like German types of dishes, right? Is that what you'd say? Yeah, I, I don't. A lot of I don't. The word fusion isn't as common anymore because the problem was that it was one of those things that at first people said fusion, then it became almost like cliche. Like everyone's like, I'm opening a fusion restaurant, and it's like, <laughs> okay, you're probably some basic person who's just trying to be trendy. So, the, as I stated before, there were a few Austrian like native dishes which you know we'll we'll probably get into especially with the entrees but everything else is just kind of whatever i mean you see scandinavian influence you see french influence you see some pastas i mean it, it wasn't adhering strictly to a particular theme aside from supposed to be seasonal cooking but i mean even that you could argue there's a little bit of a deviation uh. yeah i think that that probably is a more appropriate term to say the influences because fusion i think would be more taking a, a dish that's from one way of doing it and then completely putting in ingredients that would not be used. Like for example, Asian food, then you add cheese stuff. Cause as we discussed, yeah. I think it was in a different series. We've discussed it, but yeah, I know great people series, how Asian food doesn't really have that much cheese. I think that would be more of a fusion, but yeah. this one, I think, yeah, you're correct in, in that certain dishes will have mm. different aspects from different. So, okay, this part of the dish being plated in this way, or this combination of flavors is influenced by something in Sweden. Then this other part is influenced by some Austrian dish. So those things might be plated together, but I don't think they're necessarily fused together. So I think that's that's kind of uh, what I've seen with this. And it's a Michelin star restaurant, as you mentioned, it was. And there is a unique <clears throat> aspect, I think, with Michelin <clears throat> stars, whichever kind of thing, whether you respect <clears throat> that system or not of grading, I think one of the things that is really evident to see with most Michelin star places is the amount of thought that goes into the ingredient choices the the mouth feels um i think it was a different term that i was thinking of texture uh, it, the textures of the foods mm-hmm. are in there the, the hot cold kind of nature yeah. that works together um the the combinations that you want them to go through a bit of a journey while they're going through and most definitely also the plating the way it's actually put on the plate i personally like to cook i'm not too big on plating it's like i cook food pop it on the plate put it out there mm-hmm. but I think you'll see with this series that there will be um some really enticing things and again apologies with this one it's been some time back some of the pictures 
the quality is not going to be as up to par as some of the other series that we, some of the other um, parts of the series and the ones going forward. But these pictures are a bit old <laughs> to date Stephen here. But it was before he was actually thinking, oh, one day I'm going to have a series where we talk about food and we put mm. it on online and things like that. So, uh, but uh, we'll make do with it. And anything else you want to say before we get into so it? So I was just going to add two more points regarding fusion. I think of what a French chef in school used to always say. He goes, they call it fusion. It's more like confusion because it's like a lot of people just putting together all <laughs> sorts of stuff that kind of like doesn't make sense. Like it's, it's. I, I've probably said this before, but like, I like there's a point where it's creative and it's something different, but then there's a point where you're trying so hard to be different that it just becomes weird. Like it's like it's being different for the sake of being different rather than something yeah. that works well. And then the other thing I was going to say, too, is that some of these dishes and I'll get into it when I explain, especially some of the entrees, a lot of the dishes that we associate with these countries may not even have been originally from there. So it's like, could you even say that's fusion? Because that that's that's uh, we discussed, I think, in one of the earlier videos about like what's American cooking. You can look at all these European dishes and say this American dish is based off that. But then Europeans would look at this dish and say, maybe might say, oh, you bastardize it or we don't do it that way or whatever. Yeah. So it's like, is that really fusion or did it become something else? You know, then that just becomes more complicated. Yeah. All right. yeah. yeah. And with this, we have done the amuse bush to begin with. Just amuse your mouth. That's the French yeah. term. And um, then we've gotten to the appetizer. I think we're still in the appetizers in this yeah. entrees and the desserts. I think we'll probably make it to the entrees in this series. The way he does it, he sends me the images. <laughs> I do some mm -hmm. maybe post editing on the images to get them ready, but I haven't actually thought and looked through them. And um, we're going to get into the part where we talk about them. Our faces are going to move off of the screen. The food will mm -hmm. be there. So I kind of just say the name of the food, then kick it over to Steven, and then we just talk mm -hmm. about the things and then just questions back and forth with it. So that's how we've been going with the series. This is part three, as Steven mentioned. Probably going to do at least one more part maybe even two more parts with the way that we've been going with this part. It's a it's a big heaping of food, but below, wherever you listen to this, there will be a menu listing of sorts, so you can go in and jump to the different dishes, or you can take your time and listen to some of them, come back later. And um, I don't know if there's anything else to say with this. Yeah, as you mentioned, the first part, we had a lot more information about the background of the restaurant, the people that were yeah. working there, the location and things like that. So definitely check that out if you're interested in more of that information. Right now, we're kind of just going to be jumping right into the dishes. If you're ready, Stephen, I think we'll, we'll yeah, get into let, it. Let, let's jump right in. Yep. <clears throat> okay, so... The first one is where is the final form of what we ended the last part with. We were in between of two different platings of this dish, and Stephen is human foie gras, so we'll, we'll <laughs> open up this, which is the Ganze Leber. Ganze Leber. Ganze. Ganze Leber. Yeah, okay. the, the A with the umlaut is an A or an A sound, so it's Ganze Leber. If Gänse there was no Leber. umlaut, if there was no umlaut, it would be Gans. So. Okay, Ganze Leber. Ganze Leber, yep. yeah. which is now the final form of this. It's foie gras with now glue glue vein, glue vine, glue vein, vine. Like think like think like like you're saying nine or like mine Kampf. You're saying vine. The e i is an i sound. Okay, yeah, like it's also like vine bar. Yeah, yeah. And this, as sure. you mentioned, is the final form of the last dish that we had and that we ended the last part with. And it's kind of a play on the things. And I think this, this is a good example of showing how it's not necessarily fusion, where it's someone working with with the, the chefs themselves working with a general thing and then trying different kinds of arrangements, different kinds of flavor profiles, different kinds of things together while maintaining that same kind of, um, the same general idea of the dish. So I think that's something that has been rather common throughout this whole thing where there's different takes on kind of the same plating. That's something that I've kind of appreciated here, yeah. Sure. Okay, so foie gras, there's basically, it was cured foie gras, it was laid out in a sheet pan. Over top is the glue vine gelée. For those who missed the last part, glue vine means like, um, <clears throat> it's like mold, mold wine, or like we call it like spice holiday wine, is basically that, uh, mixed with gelatin, then laid out on top, so there's like a nice like gelatinous sheet over top. Uh, the raisin puree was really nice. It tasted a lot. If you've ever had plum pudding, it tasted a lot like that. Like a lot of people don't get plum doesn't actually mean plum like, um the fruit it's like it's it's an older word but basically plum pudding it's made from um flour there's raisins there's orange zest there's spices yeah. this puree ta this puree tasted a lot like that that's why i thought it was really good and then um the all the, the almond cardamom powder it's 
I'd mentioned previously how the powders here, it's tapioca powder. You pour an oil into it and the powder is able to hold the oil. And then, um, so it was almond oil. Then what we do is we break open uh, cardamom pods and take out, there's actually little black seeds inside. And those would get like mixed in with the powder. So you bought, you bit into it. You had the flavor of the cardamom as well as the almond. Uh, th this definitely is in one of my top favorite foie gras of all time. <laughs> all right. <laughs> And uh, what are these cubes? Are those that's just more of the of the glue vine? Yeah, that's more of the glue vine. What it is is that they laid out some on top, and they poured some other into like a uh, sheet tray or something, and they would cut out. Um, you would take out like you you would pour it into like a sheet tray or something, pull out the piece, and you would just cut that into cubes, and those would be garnished on the plate as well. Okay. And there's a little bit of sea salt on top too. Um, it's relevant. And uh, oh, and also the hearts on fire green is greens again. Yeah, I was thinking those were mint before, but now I can just kind of see more of the difference. I think the mint, the the vein, the veins are not as red. I no. should go check. I think we might have some here. I think the vein, the, the veins are more are far more purple. Um, yeah. Okay, I just I just checked. Okay, so why is plum pudding called plum pudding? And this is from Flash Mode. It says it has its origins in medieval England and is yeah. sometimes known as plum pudding or just pud, pud. Yeah. <laughs> um, though this can also refer to other kinds of boiled pudding involving dried fruit. Despite the name plum pudding, the pudding contains no actual plums. These liars, I guess the English, they, they, can, they can do whatever they yeah. want in their language. Uh, <laughs> due to the pre-Victorian use of the word, plums as a term for raisins. Okay, so Christmas mm -hmm. pudding, also known as plum pudding or figgy pudding, is a dish as famous as it's misunderstood. Uh, then, as now, the, the plum in plum pudding was a generic term for dried fruit, most commonly raisins and currants with, with prunes and other dried preserves and candied fruit added when available. So, yeah, that's that, that link will be here for that, for the plum pudding. We'll have that somewhere if you can find it. But yeah, so that's, that's interesting. And there's probably a lot of other dishes that we could probably think of. I can't really think of them right now. I was focusing on this, but there's probably some things we can probably think of, or you listening, guys, gals, and everything else in between can think of some things which are named something, but it's not actually in there. And I'm really a big fan of like etymology and going back and finding out why things are thought, called what they are. But yeah, go ahead. One thing that just occurred to me actually, as you're saying that, is there's mincemeat pie, but the, that name has also been pie, applied to fruit pies. Like you can go to the store and you can buy, it's called mincemeat pie, but it's chopped up fruit. So it's a similar thing. Whereas I think originally there was meat in it and there still are meat pies um I, I was trying to get rose to make one for me actually but um but uh you know there also are like things like that where they kept that old name but it became something else and i guess i think too it, it may also be like the difference in diets between countries like i think in the uk they're bigger on meat pies whereas here like we have chicken pot pie and occasionally other things like like we're big on sweeter pies so that could be like a preference based on the country and their diets too yeah yeah yeah. Is it? Yes. Yeah, so for the, for the people listening, is there anything that you know of that was called one thing and then now it's called something else in the cuisines or places that you're familiar with? That, that would be interesting. Well, because if you remember too, I was talking about the cheesecake, the Basque cheesecake versus the American one, and I was saying how the Basque one, yeah, it wasn't as sweet and it was a bit airier, but then like ours is sweet and dense, and then the Scandinavian one apparently is like more savory. So again, that has to do with the diets and what the people there did and the history and all those things. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so with this, with this and the the previous form, which was the the foie gras topped with the gizma powder, be puree. Which one did they have? Did they, you said this was the final form. So they had that other one before they had this one, and then they eventually yeah. switched to this one, or was it something that would fluctuate depending on the season? What what was the deal with this? They were tweaking the ingredients. I think the second one was a bit more Christmassy because, as you can probably tell, this was around Christmas time. So it's playing on a few different themes because it's, you know, the mold wine. You have the puree that tastes like plum pudding and then almond and cardamom just sort of, you know, add as, as another depth of flavor. I mean, I think cardamom's a really underrated spice. Like I've had yeah. cardamom ice cream. I thought um, this was nice. And like I say, it's cool because people think cardamom, they think of the thick pods, but there are seeds inside. So you can break those up and you can either grind those up or you can toast them or you could just mix it in with the powder here and i mean there's you know there's a lot you could do i think i think there was even a cardamom caramel i saw at one point that looked pretty interesting mm. uh. interesting uh. cardamom for me is i really like putting it in this like plain white rice and you have just, like some plain white rice you put some cardamom in it sometimes you put some cardamom some soy sauce some butter and you just mix that together it's, it's really really good that way 
it's also try it if you if you're somebody who likes baking and you like kind of uh, like the banana breads or like a ginger snap kind of cookie type of thing try switching cardamom in there you can also get some really interesting flavors and taste from that it's it's something that i like using it, it yeah it's one of my 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 favorite spices i think one like one of the top I, it goes through phases but I, yeah i go through phases where i really enjoy a lot of cardamom in my well I, I, was, I was saying with abraham too Anything it's interesting else? because well, what I was going to say is I was interesting. I was discussing with Abraham how some of these spices are interesting because in America, a lot of these we associate as being with sweeter things, but a lot of these have savory applications as well. Like, you know, we tend, we tend to think of cinnamon as like, you know, cinnamon toast, cinnamon toast crunch, like cinnamon desserts. Like we tend to think um, cloves being in like, you know, apple pie and stuff, but, or sorry, pumpkin pie. But um, a lot of these countries, like especially India and the Middle East, it's often used in savory applications. And I think it, I think not enough people appreciate that. I mean, even some of the old school French stuff, they put cloves and other things in uh, savory items. I think, I think those, those should be explored a little more. I mean, some would say that's old school, but I think people certain people don't appreciate things that you where you use some of those these other spices and savory applications at least in my opinion yeah 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 most definitely we we'll definitely try out there and again there's that one meme that i've talked about before where uh, it wasn't it wasn't a meme or, or something just one of the marvels of, of current timeline and if you listen to this chances are you're living in a place that has this as a, as a fact where it just had a, a just a, a basic picture of somebody's spice rack and it's just like like a hundred years ago, or yeah, even a hundred years, because a hundred years ago was like 1920s. Like, yeah, mm. to have an average person have that many access to spices was unheard of, really. Like, maybe the Queen of England's pantry would have that many access mm. to spices that you find in an average American's, like an average middle class American's uh, kitchen. Well, I don't know. The average middle class Americans cook that much anymore. Mm. But anyway, like, you have the access to it 200 years ago when they were having the spice wars and people were literally. Mm. Conquering mm-hmm. countries for like <laughs> specific spices, <laughs> it's like, but then now people are just like, yeah, I'm just going to have my similar comes with the stick with my plain, very plain stuff that's prepackaged instead of going out there and really experimenting and trying all these different things that you can have. This, I've had enjoyment experimenting in the kitchen, and I'm. It's one of the things I look at people who don't do it. I'm like, why? Why are you just mm-hmm. accepting the bland? in the world when you have culinary goodness out there that you can enjoy yeah well i was going to say i mean even if you're like you go upstate like where i'm from i mean there are specialty stores here and there i mean you can go to these indian stores you can get uh, spices there's usually like asian supermarkets there's a um in um the city of poughkeepsie there's a um it's called casa latina it has um like a lot of like Central and South American spices, like you know, I mean, you don't have to be like in a major city to get access to some of this more unique stuff too. So yeah. I'd imagine, I mean, I'd imagine if you live in other areas, like I mean, because where I grew up was kind of middle of nowhere. I mean, I've said before, like my town had under five thousand people, but I mean, you can drive twenty minutes, so you can find places where you can buy this stuff. So I'd imagine that's the case in a lot of a lot of areas. Yeah, yeah and if you're if you're one who's into who has some 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 space, or if you make some. Mm-hmm potted you can get some potted plants or if you have this a small yard some access to just some some soil somewhere instead of plants just for looks you can also plant some of these herbs and find get more knowledge and plant things that you can actually end up using yourself and uh it's 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 a good process it's been something that's that's i think i've appreciated and very few people that i've heard who have gotten into just knowing more about their end up being upset. I can't really think of anyone who I, I saw learn more about the food that they eat and be like upset. Maybe if you're talking about like factory farming, then like I can't eat the burger anymore. But at the same point, mm. you'll be able to now find the better burgers and understand the difference between a free range, like grass fed burger versus one that's been in a pen. There's actually flavor differences in that most definitely that I think once you know. But yeah, I don't know. Yeah. All right. Uh, with, okay. With, do you do you know where they got the foie gras from? Was, was it was it uh, is it local? Is it somewhere in New York? Or was it some farm? Do they have a personal relationship with the people doing? Because with this with this food, you are what you consume series. We're going to start adding other aspects of other food related things back in in the non dish and dish. And Stephen had sent a a article about a farm that's doing more like humanely raised foie gras. So we just have the general institute because that's something that we both care about. Just the mistreatment of just other life forms, but they, they plants, they animals. They're still delicious in some ways, but I'm just trying to see if he actually knows where they're sourcing. Yeah, some so of this. well, 
So where where the vast majority of people buy foie gras from, it's called the Hudson Valley Foie Gras Farm. It's actually not terribly far from where I grew up, ironically. Um, mm -hmm. It's on the it's on the opposite side of the Hudson River. It's in a town called Ferndale. What a lot of what a lot well, I think what they do though is they typically sell it to other companies that sell meats and other things, and people order it through that. So there's like the company D'Artagnan. I think I mentioned them before. Like they sell they sell whole foie gras, but they also like some of it they make into like terrines and pates and sell they also sell like other um cured meats and so on so i think i think with a lot of these um purveyors it's like you know it's like the farm produces it they sell it to these certain uh wholesalers who then sell it to restaurants and so on and then i know like i know like with d'artania you can order stuff directly uh from them online have it sent to your home and all that too okay yeah so yeah. I don't. I, I, I know Thomas. Here. We'll have a link to that as well. So yeah. Well, I know, I know Thomas Keller has cited the Hudson Valley Foie Gras Farm as well. Like I think he gets it from there too. Um, again, I think they're like the main producer. I mean, you could probably buy it from France too, but of course, issues with importing and there's probably different rules and things. So as far as I know, the Hudson Valley Valley Foie Gras Farm is like D one. Uh. Cool, cool. So yeah, they have a lot of charcuterie. Charcuterie is the best stuff. No cheese. The mm -hmm. folks on, like animal products, direct mm -hmm. animal products. Yeah. yeah. Right. So, anything else you have to say? You want to say about the Gans Ganslaber? Ganslaber. Ganslaber. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. No, I mean, this, this is definitely one of my favorite preparations, like I say. I mean, I, you know, at, at some point, this is one of these things I may try to recreate or at least tweak it a bit. Uh, again, I love cardamom, experiment with that, some of the oils. And um, I just love, too, the like the recreations of sort of like plum pudding, but into a puree. Because I, I, I typically get plum pudding every Christmas. Like, we just buy it at the store and we eat it. Uh, typically, I get it with the brandy sauce they serve. It's nice. It's really dense, so Like, it's the kind of thing that... You either prepare it for a group of people and scoop into it, or it's like I'll eat it over the course of like three days because it's like really rich stuff. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, yeah, I might try that because I've been, I've been, I've been trying to find sticky toffee pudding somewhere. Where when I was in New York City, never really found it somewhere. The Churchill might have had something like that. It was a place across from, uh, yeah, but I never actually tried it. But yeah, this it, it, now that I've looked into that, I might actually think of trying to make my own somehow. Yeah, I think well, I think because I learned about it in a Christmas Carol, which I always I always loved the story. So then I like I think I wanted to try it, and I went out like as a kid at some point, and it just it's been like a Christmas <laughs> yeah. tradition for me. Uh. Yeah. All right. So All right. Uh, next poem. Yeah, sure. Okay, so now we on to vegetarian. Uh, okay, spezto, spezto, spezto. Spetzle, Sorry, that's a typo. It's supposed spetzle. to be. It's, it's supposed to be T Z L E. Sorry, I messed that up. Okay, spezle. So yeah, spezle. Spezle. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Vegetarian spezle. Spezle. Yep. So, so this you could order either as an appetizer or as an entree. Um, this is the German pasta. It's it comes from the word spots, which means um, sp it means sparrow in a Swabian dialect. Swabia is in the south. For those who don't know, um, the originally the way they made it was they would just take, they would take dough and just sort of push it through. Uh, through like holes in a pan and they apparently they used to come out looking like little sparrows now they're kind of a rough shape some people have compared them to corn pops i mean it's not an exact you know comparison but the idea is you you get you make the dough you work it a bit you get water boiling you push it through a perforated pan into the water and then that cooks it you pull it out and then when you pick it up you just heat it up in a pan there's different ways you can do it what we typically did here was there was um you would get some um you would get some uh what was it? Cream in a pan that you, you sort of heat up the cream. You'd add the spatula, which you know was previously cooked into the into the cream. Uh, you finish with some cheese and then the vegetables, which were blanched beforehand and added. You would put in the vegetables, as you can probably tell, change seasonally. So, for example, here it was uh, a type of mushroom and zucchini. Um, I know, like for example, in spring we use like fiddlehead ferns and like ramps and things like that. Then fall we do squash. So you know, of course, it just changed depending on depending on the season and what was available. But the basis was the same. Uh, again, this was typically you could get. It, I think you could get this as an appetizer, but it was typically an entree for. It was like one of the vegetarian entrees, um, not vegan though. Of course, um, you probably. You might be able to. I think we actually did do it vegan, but it's basically just like blanched pasta and vegetables. I mean, you could do that, but I wouldn't really recommend yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Wait. With the, veg the vegetarian, and vegan, like, if you're vegetarian, can you have things like ghee? Is, is it, it, gets, it depends on the person, well, right? Well, ghee Ghee is – well, yeah, because there's like the lacto-ovo-vegetarian diet where you can have uh, dairy and eggs. Like I've known okay. people who've done that. So like you could 
you could um you actually have, yeah if you were lacto ovo vegetarian you could have this because there's no meat it's just um cream and uh cheese but um again vegan you would have to have some substitute or something and then i mean i know there's like there's vegan cheese and like you could cook things in other types of milk but i don't think the textures would really work with this i mean if so if somebody you know if any vegans out there are listening and have any ideas on this i'm willing to hear it but you know i just think some of the textures would be kind of weird <laughs> Yeah, and I'm wondering, is there also something with, I know now they have um, one of my friends, she's, uh, she's lactose intolerant mostly, like she can have ice cream stuff, but then it, it eventually gets to her. So of, of, uh, that might be, yeah, that might be something else to look into just to, on, a, on a separate, on this, you know, what we consume series might get into that. But yeah, there's some way, to, it's still milk, but there's something taken out of it. So it's not like bean milk or anything, like with soy stuff like that, but it's more or nut milk that they have, or nut juice, nut juice or bean juice. It's actually just cow milk, but something taken out. Well, there's also, I, I think I might've mentioned this before, but there's also, you can take a lact lactase and enzyme supplement mm -hmm. and ACE means anything ending with ACE is an enzyme. So that actually like breaks down the sugar so you can have it. My friends who had the raw milk farm also said that people who were lactose intolerant could actually have raw milk because the healthy bacteria is still there. And then apparently that helps your body break down the lactose, whereas, once it's pasteurized and homogenized, a lot of that stuff, those enzymes get killed off. So your body doesn't break it down as naturally. So I think there is something to that as well. But, you know, there's all that controversy with raw milk. So. Yeah. Think about the, you think you, you said this, so you, doing this, you know somebody who was involved in this actual process? Yeah, we had some friends upstate who have a raw milk farm, and they were saying how apparently lactose intolerant people have drank the milk and they're actually fine. And the theory behind that is because the pasteurization kills the lactase enzyme as well as the healthy bacteria. And the thing is, with that healthy bacteria and with that enzyme, your body can digest lacta lactose fine, even if you're lactose intolerant. But because all that stuff is stripped out with the heating and homogenizing. Um, but then it's also like, I, I think, I think you know, they, some people have said that your body is not supposed to have too much lactose anyway. But again, it's like, I guess because Europeans have been eating cheese and milk and stuff, even pasteurized stuff for a long time, it's like, I guess we adapted okay. Uh, Evolutionary wise, you select if your if your if your body's not strong enough to have to to make do with that kind of diet in a more state of nature kind of environment, you just won't be as strong enough to be able to get enough resources to be as attractive enough to the female. And if the female can't mm -hmm. actually be strong enough to carry children to term, healthy children to term, based off of the diet there. So these are the kind of things that slowly by slowly kind of select uh, out. That's why there was people in in um. In North America, the natives who just had a weakness to alcohol because it just wasn't something that was in their diet. That's why still to this day, as we've mentioned before, mentioned even in this series, I think in this series, where um, the the Asian cuisine just doesn't have <laughs> any any actual cheese in it because it just wasn't a regular thing. And even with cheese in general, I've cut out milk for most of my diet. I still have cheese because cheese is amazing balls. But um, I just I was. I was improving my health and my diet and I was looking at different things and doing the research. I'm like, yeah, the lactose thing, no other animals really drink milk past their childhood. And on top of that, humans are drinking cow's milk, which is made for baby cows. So, and they, they drink it along with other foods as well when milk itself as human animals growing. I think it's advised about the first six months of a child's life, it should just be breast milk. And that grows them themselves. So everything's in there that needs to, con to construct the body yet we have this certain cultures where we're like, I'm going to have a cup of milk and all these other things. I wonder why I'm putting on weight. It's like yeah. <laughs> you're eating two meals. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, I was going to add your other point too. I think it's interesting because you were talking about th selecting things out, but in the two populations you described with alcohol and dairy, th those, those things didn't exist in those cultures, so it didn't matter if you were sensitive to them. There was no... Yeah. There was no incentive to select those out because at, at people, they just weren't accessible. People didn't eat them. So... If you were, you know, if you, you, it wouldn't matter if you were lactose intolerant because you likely weren't exposed to it anyway. It wouldn't matter if you, you know, if you didn't handle alcohol well because you likely weren't exposed to it anyway. But then when these cultures started mixing, that's when we started seeing the problems because it's like, okay, I'm trying alcohol for the first time. And, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, I can't break it down. <laughs> and that kind of says that that's, that's an example that, that white people are, 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 are weird mutant creatures. <laughs> <laughs> because you go more to the human beings that were just used to the regular things that you find unprocessed in the, <laughs> in the world. They, they really have negative reactions or, or are too susceptible to some of these things that white people have in their, in their own crafty little ways. 
But that's part of living in places through the winter and that selection where you have to preserve certain foods. We've talked about this. It's probably going to come up in this series. It came up already with the plum pudding, just how to, the histories of how some things were developed. Some things were developed entirely by accident. It was some throwaways yeah. or something. Of, but then people, when you're starving in certain situations, you have to find how to actually yeah. eat certain things. Certain cultures don't eat things. Like I've talked about this one tribe in Kenya that won't eat fish from Western Kenya. They would rather go and scrabble and get these little small beans and have to multiply, multiply, have to boil multiple times in a drought in order to pound it, pound them out and get some kind of flour and eat some kind of like flat bread off it. But fish is not something they have. And then I just found this other channel on YouTube. Uh, it's like Masaru's Kitchen or something. There's another, someone else who does a similar thing as well, but it's this guy living in one of these islands in, in, in Japan and he's a skin diver. So he goes and dives in and he does this breaking down family food and cooking. And he's like eating sea cucumbers and like uh, like lionfish and all these like clams. And it's like, why did they develop eating those foods? Like, what's the the process of going around to be like this sea cucumber, which is like this weird anemone thing that you push down and then the stomach gets thrown out of its mouth? Like, I'm gonna figure out how to cook this. Like, why? <laughs> but that's that's what human beings do. And eventually, some people die from simple beans, and some people have tolerances to drinking liters of alcohol that that's just part of this amazing human animal that we are yeah well there's there's a, i've heard it too i gotta look further anyway but the back the countries that are more associated with drinking uh have more enzymes to break it down um look at my background german polish russian well that explains me so <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, well because i had a pretty high tolerance for it and and I don't, I'm almost like a bigger guy, so I think that could be some of it. But then also, it's we've had the tribal uh, alcohol, um, the, and the gourds, the kind of kind of thing. I think yeah. now I need to double check, but I'm I don't know if that came in only. I think it might predate the colonials because Kenya is only like about 51 years independent, yeah. but then the British came in before. And I think they might have been making it's called like Changa when they have like the traditional brews and things like that. But then there's other there's other brews as well. So I I'm not quite sure if that predates the the Europeans arriving in Africa or arriving in Kenya. But yeah, I'll I'll, I'll double check that. Yeah, you know, we we could even do yeah. a separate conversation about the history of alcohol and stuff. I find that stuff really interesting. Like there's a book about wines and how a lot of them came from the Middle East and got went to Europe and got renamed. And yeah, there's there's a lot of interesting stuff with that for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's something we can note that. Oh, do like sure. a alcohol one. Uh, yeah. Alcohol in the the foie gras one. Yeah, we will have some separate ones where we just kind of highlight things. So, yeah, because we had a burger series that was pretty good too yeah. as well. Stephen Nomi has an accompaniment with wines or, or beers yeah. and things like that, and he tells us. But this one, he was working in the kitchen, so I think this is a bit different. We haven't really had too many of the of the wines to go along with these. But yeah, if, oh, I, if you I, think I of anything that. Yeah. I, I drank a lot of beer. I drank a lot of beer when I worked here. We usually drank it after the shift. So I got um I got the Rata Burger, the Pilsner. It was actually that was the one I think I mentioned before. That's actually uh, that was Bismarck's favorite beer. They even call it the Consulate Brow, the Chancellor's Brew, because it was his favorite. Uh, again, we can talk about it somewhere else. But like Pilsner originally is Czech. There's a city uh, P Z L E N. I'm not sure how to say it in the Czech language, but it became Pilsen in German. That's where Pilsner came from, type of lager. Mm -hmm. And there was also Vian Stefan which I mentioned before, that was one of the ones I showed in the burger series. Weihen is the the beer that was founded in uh, 1040 AD. So uh, it'll be cool in 2040 when they have their thousandth anniversary. It'd be really exciting. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Well. Yeah, very few companies that old. Very few companies are in yeah. last. I mean, majority of companies. Let's yeah. uh, discount the ones who are, that fail in, in their first uh, uh, one, one to three years. But the ones who last like 10 years, very few get to even a yeah. hundred, so to have a thousand is, is pretty pretty amazing. Yeah. That's probably one of the oldest yeah. companies, then. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's definitely the oldest brewery that still exists, as far as I know. Uh. Huh. Okay. I maybe just like a, it's a cheater for later, but are, are there any takes on this? Did they ever do the same kind of preparation, but then throw some some fish in there, throw some clams, throw some meat, throw some scallops, or something else, or was this just uh, in particular done as a vegetarian? Just like this, it's interesting. You should ask though, because I've seen different spätzle preparations. Like I've seen one, um, I've seen one made with bacon. I've seen one um, made similar, actually, to sort of like a potato gratin, where they do like um, cheese and stuff, and then they bake it in the oven, then you scoop into it and eat it. That's really nice. It's, it's I guess, it's like okay. their version of a mac and cheese. Um, I've seen dessert spätzle where they actually have like 
the pasta, maybe you add some sugar or cinnamon to it and you do like fruit inside, like mix in with mm. it. You know, you can do different things. Yeah. I mean, um, yeah. I, I had a German cookbook, I think at one point, not here, but I think at my parents' house, and they talk about some of this stuff because, you know, it's basic pasta dough. I mean, all you have, you know, we talked a little bit about pasta, like the dish above. All you have to do is like add different things to the dough and throw in different fruit or vegetables. You could tweak it a lot of different ways. Uh. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's something good. If you have a pasta maker at home, this sounds like something you could try. I, that's something we try to mention occasionally, the, the difficulty level of making certain things, but this seems like something that could be good. And as Stephen mentioned, there's a variety of different ways you can do it. Well, I mean, this, you, you can buy Spetzla makers where it's basically like, um, it's like a rectangle with holes in it. Then there's a little hopper on top where you, uh, you put the dough in, then you push it back and forth and then it falls into the water. Okay. The other thing you can, the other thing you can do is even just take a perforated pan and just like put the dough on top and just press it through yourself. I mean, it's kind of a rustic looking thing. So the pieces don't have to be even, I mean, that's just how you make it. Um, whereas like if you're making some of these Italian pastas, like, you know, that's why you have those machines because they're all supposed to be the same size. Mm -hmm. But I mean, this is like kind of a rustic peasant dish, so it doesn't have to be, you know, perfect. Uh. Yeah. Good to go. You got anything else to add on this? Nope. That's that's it. Okay. So the next one has some fish. Uh, we have some Zander. Zander is umla. It no, it's it's pronounced uh, Sonder. So the remember the Z at the first at the beginning of the word, it's like a T S sound like hats or something. So it's Sonder. It's a short A sound. So it's uh Sonder. Uh, yeah. Okay. Sonder. Sonder. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a uh, walleye pike, seasonal vegetables, arugula puree, egg cream, and dill water. Yeah. So basically, you know, walleye pike, I mean it's a leaner white fish. It's a little it, it's it's I, I haven't had this too much. It's a little pricier. Um, apparently, it's big in certain kosher restaurants. I have to talk to Abraham about this, but I remember like there was a certain time of year where this would actually go up in price because of Jewish holidays. Um, the seasonal vegetables, okay. you could probably tell those change season by season. I mean, there it looks like there were some turnips or something. Uh, you know, sometimes we, sometimes it was beets, sometimes it was squash, you know, depending on what was available. Um, arugula puree, you could probably tell that's blanched arugula pureed. Um, it's a leaner puree, if I recall, it was arugula, you know, a little, um, what was in there? Arugula, I think it might have been thickened with like a little bit of guar gum just to like thicken it so it held its shape a little better. Um, let's see, horseradish powder was the tapioca powder with the horseradish oil. The egg cream, I think I'd mentioned that in a dish above, in a, um, it was the mackerel dish. Basically what you do is you take, um, you take egg yolks, a little bit of water and salt, you put them in a bag and you cook them in a water bath with a sous vide with a, sous -vide, with a circulator. So the idea is that you cook the egg yolk just lightly enough so it forms almost a gel like consistency and you can actually like sort of pipe it out onto the plate in that shape. And then the dill water, if I remember correctly, was blanched dill pureed with some water, a little salt. Then you added, I'm trying to remember if it was agar agar or one of those other lick, those other, uh, it might've been like guar gum or something. It was one of those thickeners, but like, uh, oh, xanthan gum, that might have been it. But um, you add just you add just enough to thicken it a little bit so it holds its shape because it's called water, but the idea is that it's like it's almost I'm trying to think of something to compare it to. Um, but it's not it's not water, it's not a puree. It's kind of like I don't know if a milkshake is a good comparison. It's kind of that consistency where it's like it's pourable, but it's not gonna run all over the place. And then um, what the chefs would do that was interesting was that they would plate this up. Each one had their own little take for the uh, presentation here. So like, I remember um, the sous chef I worked with at the time, he would actually do a checkerboard. It looked really nice. He would do the yellow uh, as squares and he would actually pour the green inside to sort of like fill in the holes. So that looked really nice. And then um, the other chef did an interesting design. It was almost this like spiral thing. And it was funny because the, the sous chef made fun of the chef and he goes, I don't like the spiral. It's too psychedelic. He's like, it's like Tim Burton meets Austin Powers because it was just a green and yellow spiral. Like it looked kind of cool, but yeah, it did look kind of trippy at the same time. But, um, you know, and then I, I think one of the other guys just did it like this. So it was like the presentation would vary a little bit, but it's just it was based on their own preferences. Sure. All right. Thoughts and uh, okay. comments. Yeah. Would they, would it, was it like somebody was in charge of doing it per day or if you, if like five people came and ordered, they would get like three different preparations of it if, if it was on the same day or is it like, how did that well, work? You, 
Well, the rule the rule in restaurants is you always have to be consistent, and it had to do with who was working the pass that night. So, like, if it was the chef, the sous chef, or the owners, like, they would all do it one way, but it had to be that same way. Because the problem is, if it goes out to each table, it's supposed to look the same, because the concern is, if you were to do, like, these three designs, it would be like, hey, that one looks better than mine. Hey, that looks better than mine. Oh, mine, you know, mm -hmm. like, it just, it's supposed to look the same on everything. So, if... If you came back on another night and ordered it and another chef was working, the presentation might be a little different. But if, if, if it all went to one table and it was one night, it would always be the same. Yeah. And then now here you're going to have – I like that they kept the crispy skin on the on the top, so that would add yep. some crispiness. Then flakiness of the, of the of fish flesh, that's, that's good. And then yep. you said that – what, what was that you said was under – the seasonal vegetables – that's oh okay. It's the way they're cut. It looked almost like garlic cloves, but it's probably not garlic cloves. It's, no, it's uh, it's um, turnips. It's turnips cut into sections, maybe like eighths or not or something. Like if you if you if you take a turnip, cut it in half, and cut that into wedges, that's that's what they did there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And you said this is still an appetizer, so this is not. Too no, big no. Big they, sorry, we're we're, we're actually, we're actually uh, sorry we're. At, we're actually getting an entrees. I should have mentioned that, but um, because the okay. spatula, the last one was an appetizer. Yeah, this would be the first entree, yes. Okay. Good, good. Yeah, so the Zander, 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 Zander. 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 Do you yeah. hear anything with the name? Why? What's what's with this name? I'm actually not sure. It's funny. I hadn't actually really uh had pike before. I know walleyes are when you fish for them, those are the, they're the pike, but they have the fangs. You have to be careful when you catch them. Yeah. Um, I never really thought much of them in terms of eating. I always thought of them as a sportier fish, but I guess people eat them too. So you know, it's kind of, it's kind of like a leaner white fish. Um, I typically eat more meat than fish, like I say, so I'm not as familiar. I mean, some of these other fish, of course, I've tried, but like it's not something I've ever ordered actually when I've eaten out. Uh. I, I, I personally like fish. It's just I. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't tried too many kinds. The, the, the typical fish that we eat here in Kenya is tilapia, but then there's omena, which is like some smaller thing. I don't know what the actual name of that is. Into the uh, term invasive species, all earthlings. So it's like things mm. moving around. You know, there's, I mean, they use that. On, it's like they. Some people use that on nature, like, oh, it's an invasive species. And then at the same point, they say, okay, this invasive species needs to be removed. And then you say, okay, if somebody moves to another country and they need to integrate to that country, like, no, you're not allowed to tell them to to match the, the customs of the place that they're moving to. Then why are you calling an animal invasive species if the animal just wants to go and just be whatever it wants to be, wherever it wants, wherever it is? So <laughs> this is kind yeah. of an aspect of it. Where the, people want to preserve nature, the state of nature in some sense. But they don't carry that on to humans and understand that, yes, some animals live in certain areas and develop certain ecosystems that fit to that area. And if another animal comes in and disrupts that, we call that invasive in general. Does not necessarily mean it's completely negative. And there's, there's ways that maybe that new animal coming in could eventually figure out some kind of equilibrium and some balance in that new place. But I think it's on the animal coming in to adjust, but sometimes animals come in and just dominate the, the area. So yeah, that's mm. that's throwing a bit of politics in the, in the mm. dish and dish series. We do that yeah. sometimes. <laughs> yeah. As always, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So uh, again, with the crispy skin, the, the flaky flesh, then you have the, um, the you said the boiled or steamed vegetables, and now the different kind of the different kind of fluid feels that you're going to have, the fluid textures you have yeah. in the puree, then you said more of like a pasty, not not like paste, similar like a thick, um, yeah, I'm also trying to think like what, what might be, it's probably, I'm trying to think maybe some kind Cause, cause, oh, I was gonna add one other thing with the skin, the technique for getting the skin crispy. And if you notice here, the skin is actually scored. There's little slits and um, cut into it. And the idea is that you cut a slight slit because the idea is it allows the heat to penetrate the skin, which makes it crispy. You don't want to cut the slit too deep because then the heat will penetrate further into the fish, which you're not trying to do. You want the fish to be delicate, but you want that skin to be crispy. Thomas Keller, I have to revisit the French Laundry Cookbook, but apparently he has a technique. I guess he, I'm trying to remember if he takes like a knife or some other thing, and he actually squeezes the water out like he almost compares it to squeegeeing where they'll actually take it and like they'll take the fish and they'll actually slide it along and they'll press out all the water you have to do it in a certain way where it's like you don't mutilate the fish but the idea is that you squeeze out the water so 
there's less water to sweat out when you cook the fish because the problem is if you throw the fish into the pan and there's a lot of water in the skin, it'll take a while to cook all that water out. And then the skin, the rest of the fish will overcook in the process. But if the skin's pretty dry, it'll crisp up faster. And then you have a crispy skin and then you can finish it either in the oven or in the pan, but you won't overcook the fish either if you follow. Yeah. Yeah, because fish, fish flesh is very, very uh, tender and very susceptible to, to burning, yeah. Oh, one thing I was going to say, there's sort of a challenge cooking meat versus fish where I think fish is way less forgiving because, as you say, it's very delicate, so it's very easy to overcook a fish. The challenge with meat is that meat can be a little more forgiving, but the challenge is the various range of temperatures. Like this, you always cooked like all the way through. But the thing is, if you're working a meat station, you may have a steak, a lamb dish, a chicken dish, all this, and there's different temperatures and you have to remember like, okay, this one's rare, this one's medium, this one's well, this takes this long to get to medium, this takes this long to get to well, that can be very tough. So there's a different challenge here, depending on what you're doing. Yeah. yeah. I was wondering, with, with the, can you do uh, different kinds of, is it possible to like a medium fish if you're using like sous vide, like when you're doing like more of a slower cooking, or is it still all the way through? So it depends which fish you're cooking. Like tuna, for example, is great, rare, and a lot of the higher end places either do it raw or rare. Um, one preparation I've had, which I like, is where you actually do um, like a Cajun spice and then you actually like do a hard sear on the outside and it's rare all the way through. It's almost like steak. It's really nice. Um, I know like but then there's other fish like like salmon. I think salmon you can actually do um, medium. I know some chefs in school were kind of critical yeah. of that, but a lot of people cook salmon well. I mean, or you can do it raw um fish like this like typically like bass type bass well this is pike but like that kind of family typically you just cook all the way through um catfish you cook all the way through uh so i think it would depend on the fish and the preparation um yeah. but there are certain fish that like even you know even in higher end restaurants there are certain fish that like they would never cook rare or medium it just it's it's a texture and just also the type of fish so yeah, yeah because of course on one end you have the sushi or sashimi which is this yeah. direct like raw like different kind of seafood and fish and yeah. things like that then yeah if you do think about it in it's mostly fully cooked through baked or fried or deep fried. It's only a fully cooked through fish when you actually get to the cooking part of it. Yeah. yeah. All right, anything yeah. else you have to add on that? On no. Our wall no. Right here? Okay. Uh, did they ever, okay, so it's just the chefs who are doing, so you said it was the position they were in. What was that position you said the through? The, the pass. The pass. Yeah. So that's after everything's been cooked and put. So that's the primary plating place. Yeah. So the way it typically works in restaurants is that you have the different stations and then everyone is cooking different things. And what they do is they'll pass they, they'll pass things up forward to the past. So like what they'll do is um, the okay. person working the meat station will cook the fish and then they'll put it on a it's called a sizzle platter. It's a little metal tray, usually with paper towels. So like butter, or whatever can seep off. Um, they'll pass that up and then the person working entremet will pass up like there will be a pan with vegetables in it or something. They'll pass that up. There's a puree that they heat up. They pass that up. And then the chef will just take each component and like puree, vegetables, fish, sauce on the outside. And then like they have microgreens and stuff nearby. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Oh, cool. Uh, uh, behind the scenes. Uh, what's going on? Yeah. It's kind of like a like an assembly line of sorts. Yeah, it different is. Different yeah. end of inputs. Yeah. But, yeah and, of, and of course, if you work in if you work in restaurants, they have it down to a science like, OK, and you, you have to. And the challenge, too, is it's how much food you're putting out, but you have to synchronize with other stations. So it's like the meat cook and the vegetable cook have to talk. And it's like, how long on the is your fish almost ready? Yeah. OK, pass it up. Is is the are your vegetables almost ready? Yes. Pass it up because there are issues where one component will be up and the other won't. But then the issue is yeah. one starts to get cold while you're waiting on the other. And then um, also the chef has to plate. So sometimes what will happen, too, is. If there's a lot going on at once, they'll put up all the stuff and then the cooks will come to the pass and help the chef's plate. And then you put out like one or two tables at once. And then they just everyone that's like all hands on deck, everyone at the pass, everyone helps plate. And then the front of the house just brings it all out at once. So you find you find ways to coordinate all this. Yeah, yeah it's a fun team environment. Yeah, yeah. seems, seems yeah. kind of good. Yeah. yeah, sure. OK, so uh, next one. Yeah. OK, so here we have. Okay, let's see. Um, Lax Forel, Lax Forel. No, Lax that's, Forel. Uh, that's more... you, you pronounce you, you pronounce e on the end. It's not French. <laughs> okay, Lax Forel, Forel yeah, or Forel? Yeah. Forel. It's a uh, yeah. Lax Forel, and, yeah. and this is Arctic char, Swiss yeah. chard puree, mussels, 
Muscle sauce, sauce fly, breadcrumbs, and potatoes. This is this is good. I like this plating. You can see now here. You can definitely you can see the texture is already just coming out. You have the, the skin out there, the paste, the leafiness. Then you have the starchy that stuff of the potatoes, and then this that uh, with the breadcrumbs and the side. This looks this looks like a fun dish. Yeah, sure. So Lachsforella actually means literally salmon trout in German. And the thing is, um, a lot of people have described char as a cross between a salmon and a trout because it looks a lot like salmon, but it's a little lighter. Trout's a very lean fish. So it means literally salmon trout. That's how you say it in German. Um, the Swiss chard puree, I think that's pretty self-explanatory. You blanch the leaves, you puree them. I think there's a little bit of xanthan gum to thicken them, thicken the puree. Um the mussels, the mussels were cooked in butter, if I recall. Like, I remember it's one of these things where they, I think they were lightly, I talked about blanching the lobster. It was a similar process where you cook it lightly so they hold their shape and then you finish them in butter and put them on the plate. Um, mussel sauce was very interesting. It was actually like the runoff of the mussels, but you, if I remember correctly, you prepared it with, um, there's actually a uh, purple mustard. I don't know if you're familiar with that. It's actually a mustard, but it's made with the um, grape um, must from the, when you make wine, um, there's a certain residue that builds up uh, on the casks, and you actually use that. You mix that with mustard, and then that becomes a purple mustard, and then um, that gets made into a sauce with the mussel drippings and some butter. It's very nice. Um, Salsify, for those who don't know, it's a uh, it's a root vegetable. Salsify in German is actually you say Schwarzwurzeln. It actually means black root. The peel is black. The inside is actually white. It's um it's very similar to um. Sort of similar to a carrot, the uh, flavor is a bit different. Typically, you cook them in milk. That's how these were done. Um, and then, let me see, the breadcrumbs, I think, were just picked up in butter. And then the potatoes were, if I remember, stamped out with a ring mold. So they were either, there was a cylinder shape, and there was also, like, a little circular shape. And those were just picked up in butter and plated. Um, thoughts, comments, questions? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the the salsify is. I thought those were the potatoes. So what what is the salsify? It's in the, so okay. So the salt the back behind the fish. So if you look at if you look at the breadcrumbs on the far right, there's a little mussel. The thing right behind that is a salsify. Okay, I thought that was yeah. a potato. Because uh, I was no. thinking more like the sweet potatoes. Because here the sweet potatoes are kind of like that. They they grow like yeah. it's more thinner, like straighter root. So the potato yeah. is the one that's hiding behind the yeah the fish. The fish. Okay. Yeah, the the ones on the top left, that's those were the ones I was describing where one's like a cylinder shape and the other's more of like a circle. And mm -hmm. those were just punched out in different shapes and then um, cooked in butter and plated. And then the salsa fee, if I remember correctly, was just um, – it depended on the which part of the root because you figure like a carrot it starts fatter and gets thinner so like mm -hmm. the middle part you do like a cylinder shape but then like the end maybe you do like a shorter like round piece so you just you just adjust your um you just adjust adjust a knife cut depending on which part of the vegetable and cook it accordingly and what does this taste like uh it's a root vegetable i'm trying to think how to describe it it's um Sort of similar to parsnips, maybe not as sweet, a little more savory. Um, it, it has a more of a neutral flavor, but it's one of those that works well with kind of th some different things because I guess like the texture kind of works. So it's similar to a carrot, but it won't have as pr much pronounced as a, as a flavor. Um, like I said, there's usually black peels. The black peels you uh, you just take off, though, because it's like they're not they're not really too pleasant to eat. I mean, it looks cool on the plate, but you can't eat it. Um I'm typically they're cooked. In, I've seen them cooked in milk a lot. That's a common preparation. I've seen these actually cooked uh, sous vide in um, like a mixture with uh, milk and other things in the bag, and then you um, pull them out. So you can do that too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, the things that take in take in flavor again yeah. with the blandness that that some people seem to stick to. Like even if you're doing like a mashed potatoes, like yeah, mashed potatoes. The people are like I'm just gonna buy whatever is at the store and just have it that way. They're like maybe I'll add some sour cream or maybe I'll add some garlic. Okay, that's well and good. My favorite mashed potatoes mix is like you, like you boil the the potatoes in like turmeric and then you have the, the it adds the color, it adds the flavor. Like potatoes are really the, potatoes are amazing. It's just like many so many different things. It's like potatoes, cabbage. These are kind of very flexible things. You can do so many different things with them. But yeah, potatoes take in so much flavor depending on how you cook them. It's it's really a, a bit of a shame. I know just the one of the best ways is just straight French fries, just uh, potato frite or whatever you want. To, just straight fresh potatoes, nice hard solid ones, double fried or twice or thrice fried as we saw in the in the burger special series that we had. But that's that's amazing enough as is. But then now there's other different things you can do to just add to the greatness that is potatoes. 
But yeah, so I, yeah, there will be a picture of Arctic char sometime, maybe earlier on after it's really striking looking fish, this big yeah. red belly of it and a rather large size of it. So with these ones, when they were doing these fish things, I saw also the walleye, it seems to be a, a larger, it's like a, I'd say it's like a medium sized fish. There's definitely some on the bigger end, not all the way going to like sunfish or anything, but there's some bigger end ones, which I we would say maybe two feet. It looks like the grown size ones are a couple of feet, like one, one, yeah. uh, maybe. So when they, when they got these, it's a seasonal restaurant. So would they say, we're going to make sure that we have Arctic char for this season, for the summer. So was it like three months, every time it's like a fish comes in and that fish probably takes, cause it's not every single part of the fish, like you're using certain parts of the fish. So would they be like, we're getting this and then we're going to have this on the menu for a week or we make sure we're stocked for a month? How, how would they work with seasonal dishes when you're working with an animal like a fish? Like are you getting a piece of it or cut? Like what, how does that happen? Well, like my example with the vegetables, you have to remember that also that these fish are different shapes and different sizes. So if you've ever seen a pike, like the pike family, they're typically like long, skinny fish. So if you yeah. cut a fillet, it's going to be like it's it's going to be more of a rectangle because it's it's narrower. So it's going to be longer, whereas like something like a char, because if you've seen a char, it looks kind of like a salmon. It's like a fattier fish with like a big belly. So it's like the the fillets are going to be more narrow because it's a wider thing. Um, and then what it is is typically as you get towards the end of the fillet, the fillet sort of tapers off. So the piece on the end would be usually longer and thinner, but then the piece in the middle would be thicker because they're uh, they're wider. So the fish, I, I don't know enough about the seasonality of fish to say like, you know, which one you get when. I mean, a lot of this stuff's available all year. It's just, they they get them from different waters. Like I know there's a whole thing with salmon where they have like a certain spawning season, then you get them around that time and then they eat certain things and the flavor's not as good. So the people who, the fishmongers and all this, they really have it down to an exact science. I know like with certain meats, for example, like lamb, you typically slaughter springtime. I know like turkey and other things you get in the fall because that's when they fatten up. Whereas like spring and summer, they're running around, but they put on fat for the winter. So that's when you hunt them. Uh, same with yeah. a lot of game animals. So it's like, I think they sort of factor in those considerations and it just depends on, okay, when those things are in season, more people get them, but people also produce more of them. So the supply and demand sort of levels off somewhere between those factors. Okay, so but it it they seem to be kind of a, a similar. There seems to me maybe it's just the way the fish is played, but they seem to have a, a similar kind of uh, genre. <laughs> the two, yeah. the zander and the um, and the lax forella, mm. looks like they're plated in the same way. So would they be on the menu at the same time, or you'd find one or the other? If I remember correctly, I think there were maybe like two fish at a time because the idea is that like it's sort of like you have a few meat dishes because like not everyone likes steak, not everyone likes chicken, but you have a few similar you have a few like fish or a few meats. So the idea is that, OK, you have like two or three choices depending. So it's like if you don't like chicken, there's beef, you don't like beef, there's uh chicken and then there's also maybe like lamb or something and then with fish it's like maybe there's like a shellfish there's like a leaner fish and like a fattier fish or something so it's like you know odds are there will be something you like it's sort of like think of what i was saying with desserts about the four c's you know coffee caramel uh citrus okay. and chocolate it's like the odds are you like at least one of those so like there's a little something for everyone it's a similar thing with proteins where it's like the odds are you'll at least like one of those enough where like okay there will be something that appeals to you yeah, yeah. Yeah, because I think there are some fattier fishes. There's some yeah. that are yeah. slimmer, yeah, and then some are probably better baked. Some are probably better deep fried. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's so also strong, different. stronger, stronger versus milder flavors, and you know, like some people like lean white fish. Some people like, um, you know, the fattier fish. Some people like fish that you know, like the delicate stuff, like sushi and sashimi. You know, it's mm -hmm. like it's it's trying to appeal to those different tastes. I mean, obviously, you're not going to please everyone, but I think like you have enough of a range of stuff where you can at least appeal broadly to those different tastes. Yeah. Yeah. I should also I should also point out that Austria is a landlocked country. So the typically in Austria, the only fish you see is um they eat trout and some of like local like lake fish, but seafood's not big in Austria. So a lot of this stuff is just creative interpretation. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so next one. Yeah. Yeah, I think I know how to say this one. <laughs> <laughs> or I might be just saying the American version of saying this one. And uh, here we have Wiener Schnitzel. Yeah. Wein, Wein schnitzel. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, it looked it looked like fish and chips to me. It looked, or like uh, fish and fish and and something. Not not the chips, but okay. So Wiener schnitzel. 
<laughs> it's a fingerling fingerling potato salad, uh, lingonberry jam, served with cucumber salad, which is uh, pictured. It will, will it'll come up. It'll we'll, come up. We'll it. get into that. Yeah. So the, this is actually the Austrian national dish. It means in uh, German, it means literally Viennese cutlet. There's an interesting story about this, how they actually stole it from the Italians because Austria <laughs> ruled over Milan for a time. And if you notice in a lot of German and Austrian cooking, uh, the breading and frying meat's not very common. It's more big in um, French and Italian stuff. But I guess they, when they ruled over Milan, they saw the, the Milanese and they thought it was nice. So they're like, why don't we copy this? And then they started preparing it in Vienna and they basically called it like Viennese cutlet. Like, oh, this is our, you know, take on, like this is our dish. It's better, all that. Um, Typically, it's made out of uh, pork or sometimes veal, you know, either or. Um, at Eddie and the Wolf, you actually had the option of getting it with pork or veal. There's a little bit of a price difference. Veal is a little pricier and the portion's a little smaller. Um, this one here was made with veal. It was typically, I want to say top round was the cut. Uh, with pork, it was typically a loin. I mean, you could do lots of different stuff. I know in um, in kosher cooking, they typically do uh, chicken schnitzel because, of course, you know, they can't have pork. Um, you could probably do like a kosher veal schnitzel, too, but it'd be pretty pricey. Um, typically, flour, egg, breadcrumb. They, they actually taught me while here, there's a way to uh, cook it so it actually puffs up. It was kind of nice. What you would do is we would actually mm -hmm. um, deep fry it. And what you would do is you would actually take a ladle and you would actually um, – Baste it with oil, and the oil would actually cause, if the breading was done properly, it would actually puff up. And my boss was telling me it's actually um, a lot of the cooking, it's not actually the fryer oil hitting it. It's actually when it puffs up like that, it creates an environment with a lot of steam, and the steam actually cooks the meat inside. And then it's um, it's puffed up like that. Then it go yeah, then it goes on the plate. And um, yeah, I was I was pretty good at doing that. They used to always uh, when I was at Eddie and the Wolf, they always had me do schnitzel because I would have these like these veals that were these like puff balls, basically. I got really good at it. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's a very, uh, it's kind of a rustic dish, but it's one of the Austrian dishes typically served with lemon here. Um, the potato salad was a German style potato salad. Uh, we actually use fingerlings here. That was the chef's preference. Um, what you did was you cooked the fingerlings, you blanched them, you made a sauce, uh, typically beef stock, chicken stock, mustard, um, vinegar. And then there were on the side, you add some uh, scallion and red onion. And what you would do is you would actually, um, you would pour the mixture, the the stock, mustard, all that stuff. You would pour it in. You'd actually have a hand, have a glove on your hand to be clear, make sure it's sanitary. Um, and you would actually mix it by hand, and the starch would actually break down, and that's how that would actually like sort of be thicken it like on its own as well. The potatoes breaking down, and you know they cook the potatoes a certain way, so they held their shape, but would break down a bit when you mix in the liquid too. And then um, you just throw in some scallions and red onion at the end. So. Um, you know, just for more flavor, because you don't you don't want the scallions and red onions to cook too much. And then um, lingonberry is a typical accompaniment. We had uh, we had huckleberry jam at one point. It was really nice. Huckleberries are a little pricier though, and just some lemon to squeeze. And then cucumber salad, which again I'll get into below, but I didn't have a picture of the cucumber salad on the plate. All right, thoughts and comments. <laughs> yeah, uh, just one thing I just came came to mind with this with more kitchen background information that you can tell us is when you have these fried dishes what's the what's the typical oil that they use to fry them and also what's what's the preparation because some sometimes as you know flavor gets into the oil as well like i know here uh, we normally do deep fried fish but once you've once we've used the the oil to fry fish it's stored and then repeatedly used to fry fish because the flavor is in there so i'm guessing if you're having something like this and you have several fried dishes you're not Putting in like uh, I think we had the the um, before we had the, the sweetbreads one. You're not frying probably frying the same sweetbreads in the same oil that you fried the Wiener Schnitzel. But maybe I'm sure some restaurants do that. They just have maybe canola oil or what whatever at some maybe lower level restaurants. But being a Michelin star, I'd think they would be maybe very different kinds of oils. Do so they reuse the oil or is just just give us some background into to the the kitchens there. It's actually a good question. No, uh, here we actually fried everything in the same oil, but the thing is there weren't many fried items because if you think about it, like a higher end place is not going to fry a lot of foods. Um, but what we were big on changing out the oil. So typically what you did was when the oil went in, it was clear, but then once the oil started to get dark and you couldn't see through it, you had to change it. And I remember you used to have to clean out the deep fryer. That was always annoying where like you would actually, um, you would drain out the, you would drain out the oil. Then you had to like, like, you know, different like breadcrumbs and things would build up at the bottom and you had to actually like wash it out, scrub it out and then put clean oil in again. So the idea is that the oil you're supposed to always see through. And the thing was the oil, 
you use the oil depending on how busy you were. Like if you were, if it was a really slow day, like you could probably use the same oil the next day. But the thing is, if you had a busy day, that oil would be like black by the end of the night. So it's like you had to put new stuff in. I'm sure in like really high end places, um, they either have separate fryers or I've even seen these little mini fryers that they will actually sit tabletop and they'll actually use those, just those for certain things. Cause um, you know, the quality it's like, you're trying to achieve, you're not going to do that. But again, in, in a place like this, you're not going to fry that many items. So it's like, you know, you have like the sweet breads, this, and like one other thing. So it's not, it's not a huge deal. It's like contaminating stuff. Now there is an issue with, um, people with celiac disease or gluten issues in general because the thing is all these fryers are fried with things that have breadcrumbs on them so we always told people like you know if you have celiac disease you can't have fried stuff here because we have to fry this breaded stuff and it's like we can't change out the oil just for one person it's not going to work so um you know it's like sorry you're, you're, you're gonna have to order other stuff yeah. and what kind of oil is it normally uh typically canola oil um some people prefer peanut oil um you, you know, they say they say things like avocado and coconut oil are good. I haven't used them. I think the issue with the fried stuff is because you need so much oil to do it. And those oils are pricier. Like, it's not practical to get, like, large amounts of that. Like, it's nice to cook at home. But, like, an oil, like a person with a huge fryer, like, especially Eddie and the Wolf, where you're feeding hundreds of people, you're not going to get a huge batch of avocado or coconut oil. It's it's going to be way too expensive to, you know, do it for yeah, that many especially people. Especially if you're throwing them up like that. For the coconut yeah. oil... Coconut oil and ghee are my favorite uh, home yeah. cooking ones, and for baking and things like that. I will, of course, use other things, and in a pinch, and all of them. Depending on the ghee that you get at room temperature, it actually solidifies, and definitely with the coconut oil at room temperature, basic average room temperature in places like uh, below 60, like once it starts getting like 65 degrees, like temperature-wise, it, it'll start melting a bit, but it's, it's very soft, and... But I also, for me, the coconut oil, I use it for cooking, but I also use it for skin, I use it for hair, it's just like an all-around oil. But yeah, I, I could imagine when I do the baking and the, <laughs> the things with it where you use like a cup, it does it does kind of take a dent into the wallet when you do it that way. Well, so and, frying and the, things, and the, this pan frying thing is definitely great. And right? that goes back to my point about food costs. Like you have to think about like, ideally, what do you want to do versus realistically, what can, what can you do? Like, yeah, I would love to have like, the best cuts of meat and like these nice oils and all this, but then you're looking at your food costs and it's like, it's going to be 40, 50%. And it's like, you're, you're trying to make money here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And there's probably some things to do with regulations. Cause I can imagine if you have a certain restaurant, depending on the quality of the restaurant, you're not really going to worry too much about it. And even with this, it's not necessarily a situation where the food, where the oil gets like poisonous, where you, it's, you're putting like, yeah, the food is not going bad by overusing, by using the oil a lot, but then, you probably can't be working at a certain top restaurant and then pass your oil on to somebody else. Like, but is there a way of filtering oil? Like in that, like yeah. recycling oil somehow? There yeah. actually is. Well, that's a lot of places do that where you actually take out the oil and you put it, you, um, you put it into a pot cause it's typically hot at first. But then what you do is then once it cools down, you take a funnel and you pour it back into the boxes that it came in and, um, that gets taken out. I guess the companies will actually come and pick it up and they recycle it or somehow, I, I don't know what they do exactly, but that's, that's always what mm -hmm. we've done. Cause the alternative would be dumping it down the drain, which especially in winter would create a nightmare. And then it's like, or it would have to be thrown out somehow, but not really the best thing to dispose of uh. yeah that's good to know that's good to know i, I think that I'm just sticking right now that's definitely going to be one of those excerpts that we pull out yeah. with this series as well like we <laughs> in some of the scenes, yeah. like sometimes we do like smaller clips from the series yeah. and it's not even it, food is not even mentioned in the clip but i think it would be good to kind of pull out some of these things but yeah so wiener schnitzel yeah um have you had wiener schnitzel anywhere else to, to compare to to the quality that you had here you probably have some bias it's stuff that you were making personally but yeah, yeah. Well, it was so funny. So I remember I was hanging out with my friend Paul a few weeks ago. We, we worked at Eddie and the Wolf together, and we used to always snack on schnitzel all the time, like during service. And when I was saying how, like, ever since then, like, I'll never ordered anywhere else because I've eaten, like, enough to last me a lifetime. I do want to try, though. There's apparently one. There's a three Michelin star place in Germany. I forget if I mentioned him. Um, his name is Joachim Wiesler, and apparently he is a high-end schnitzel on the lunch menu. What he does actually is – uh, he does schnitzel, but what he does, he actually does pumpkin seeds in the breading and he cooks it in lard. And then um, for lemon, he actually does lemon sorbet and uh, parsley. It's typically wow. parsley, too. He does a parsley powder. And then, like, I guess he has some, like, higher end potato salad. I don't know what he does, but um, that's on, like, the lunch menu. This is a three Michelin star place. I would love to try something like that at one point. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll try. I'll try to remember to get the, that up on the screen if we can yeah. track down an image uh, of that. That sounds delectable. I, 
I can spell out the name for you. I understand, like the German okay. phonetics. You might not. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah, I'm spelling it like the probably Spanish one, which is like J O A Q I M. It's probably not that. It's no, probably no. K. Probably with a K, right? Joe K. No, no, it's with a it's a. Uh, no, no, it's it's J O A C H I M. Y'all came. Yeah, that's it. Draw okay. came. Okay. Yeah. So we'll, we'll we'll try to find that and put it up on the screen. Yeah. Um, but yeah. So Wiener Schnitzel definitely would be something. If you've had Austrian food, this is the high chance this is what you've had. Yeah. It's, it's I think it's something that would be rather more common. But you probably haven't had it as good as Joe Kim's. But uh, or even just this. This is, seems to be really good. Um, as you said, and probably started as something that was just earthy, typical people's food, and then now kind of went up to this. Well, also when my yeah, parents also, came in. Sorry, you were saying? Well, I was saying also when I came in, when my parents came and eat after I started working there, we sent them this nice, I think it was like a 12 course tasting menu, and we did a mini schnitzel as one of the courses. I thought that was cool. My mom thought that was cool. She's like, oh, there it is, you know, the famous dish. Because we sent them, we sent them other higher end stuff too, obviously, like the egg and some of the other dishes you saw. I wish I had taken pictures of that whole experience. It was really cool, but I remember. Um, my chef uh, Frederick came up. He's like, you know, what do you want to do a tasting menu for your parents? I was like, yeah, that'd be great. And then um, I think it was like 12 course. And I remember it was like, you know, the poached egg dish. There was a pork belly. There was um, I'm trying to remember. And then there was like the mini schnitzel. And then there was like a dessert at the end. And I think we charged them each like, oh, yeah, we sent them all this wine. I think we charged each my each of them like 40 bucks or something so it was like you know that was like my dad was really okay. excited because he had he had well he had never tried food like this and he was like wow this was like way beyond what i expected so you know really nice again not the best thing for the restaurant's financial health but it was like it was a really nice experience yeah yeah i wish i i wish i mean i didn't have an iphone back then but now but now i would definitely record something like that for sure uh. Well, it, it was really nice too, being able to run the food out to the, my parents myself and describe them what it is like help make it and actually bring it out it was really fun yeah uh. Yeah. Mm. And I mean, the people who are working there probably had yeah, value added. You, they, they, yeah. valuable employees. So they're actually, they're actually profiting more than, than giving the yeah. discount on that. Yeah. Yeah. I think in general, I know, I know you part of any restaurant. We said that was part of what they were doing here. <laughs> it's also a typical thing. They were giving out a lot of, lots of extras and free dishes just to like randos coming in, but your parents yeah. are not necessarily like randos. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, yeah. Well, because my, my my view on that has always been that's a pri that's a privilege, not a right. Like if friends come in and like some people will be like, because this happened at Netta too. Because remember, I was a front of house manager, and the sous chef would be like, "Oh, do you want me to send your friends a nice wagyu?" And I'm like, "If you want to," but I'm like, "It's out of your budget." So I'm like, "If you're if you want to, fine, but I don't expect it." And it, you know, they would send them like the A5 wagyu, which was like you know really really up there in terms. Of, I think it was like I'm trying to remember if it was like. 200 bucks for like four ounces or something and i'm like wow. he's like do you want me to send it to you i'm like if, if you want to i'm like i don't expect this because i know it's a lot for you but you know but um you know it's like it's the same thing with me like if i go to eat at old jobs if they want to send me stuff fine but like i don't see it as like i'm entitled to this you know um, yeah. yeah all right yeah. yeah so moving on to the next you said this next one is the salad that was the cucumber salad that was that was uh, served with this or is this no is... no no that's that's going to be a little further down we'll just come back to it um because okay. what happened was i couldn't find a dish with the schnitzel that had it next to it so uh, but it but i found a plate of sides uh below which will that'll be on so we're just going to go into other entrees and i'll bring this up later yeah okay cool, cool. Yep. we'll remember that i yep. think i could I just like snip it and put it here but there's no yeah. point they just keep going yeah. in the, in the order, yep. order okay so the next one, I'm familiar with this term from, uh, what was the first time this came up? It came up, I think it might have come up with the Manette. Um, here we have Anton, Anton Brust, Brust, Anton Brust. It's Anton Brust. It's, um... Anton Brust. Was it, was it called this something? I, I remember hearing, some, we, seeing a word like this before when we were talking about see, duck, duck breast, and that's what we'll get into it. So is it, this, is this like a German version, German Austrian version of a different word? It just it just means literally duck breast in German. Like Anta is duck, and then Anton is yeah, and Bruce is just breast. Why did I find this word familiar? What was it when we heard it before? I don't know. Anyway, um, <laughs> so Anton Bruce, or maybe it was this when I was editing this this document. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, seared duck breast, farro, Parisian boiled uh, carrots, carrot puree, baby carrot, and candied fennel. Yep. Okay, so this this was a really nice. Um, duck dish i want to say it was in season the during um springtime so seared duck breast i think you can tell what that is uh farro is a type of grain if i remember correctly it was cooked in carrot juice that's why it's a little more orange looking 
um, Parisian called bald carrots. So if you remember on the Weisser Spargel, the white asparagus dish, the um, the potatoes mm -hmm. were balled out with the same baller, like the little uh, balls. And you did that. You actually did that with carrots. And then what you did was you actually took the scraps of the carrots because you picture a carrot with all these holes in it. You would take those scraps. You would make that into the puree. And that also went on the plate. And then um, baby carrot, it was just like a baby carrot trimmed down. You cut off the dirt around the stem. You peel it, um, pick it up in butter. And then the candied fennel, if I remember correctly, it was baby fennel that was cut through. And then I think there was some sugar, and it was just sort of like brown in one side on the pan and put on the plate. Um, you know, you cook it through so it has a translucent color, and it's um, caramelized on one side. Yeah, really, really a nice dish. I thought it was creative, very spring. Um, carrots and fennel. Carrots and duck are a big uh, popular combination. So and then the fennel gives it another flavor. Yeah, mm. and you can still see that the the, the, the sear on the on the skin of the the duck with the nice like white uh, part of the duck or the fats in there. Yeah, it's very delightful. Yeah, and um, okay, there's a lot of puree in this restaurant. Is that something yeah. that's Austrian in general? Or is this something that was a choice by the by the, the people running the restaurant? No, I mean I, I tend to think of puree as being like more of a French thing, but there are a lot of French places are big on like puree and then there's like usually like a jus like some type of like you know sauce with the meat and then there's usually like vegetables that's just a common way to lay out a dish um because i think you know as i mentioned before it's like because you think about it this way you have carrots but in a few different forms because you have carrot juice in the faro you have the carrots the parisian bald carrots you have baby carrot and then you have carrot puree and the the parisian bald carrots and carrot puree are clever because you you scoop out all these little balls but then you have these like scraps of carrots and then that's what you make your puree with so you use up the whole thing but you can also present you can also present it um it's in a more presentable way because it's like if you just have scraps of carrots it's like you can't put those on a plate but you don't want to throw them out either so you just cook them and make something else out of them yeah yeah i think now, now again this is one of those things that this adds value added to when you yeah. see somebody who understands the craft like if you just watch a basketball game and you've never played the game you can still see like okay these are these are athletes you can still see just the sheer human force but then once you know about the details, once you know about the plays, once you know about this, you get a higher level. And I think with this, that's definitely something that you will see the difference with these higher level restaurants. The thought process that goes between them, like as Stephen just mentioned, being able to use, you order one carrot, but then that one carrot can be transformed into so many things. Whereas you yeah. go to certain kitchens, maybe not the ones that you've worked at, but I'm sure you know people who work at places where there's just so much waste going on in, in the back of the kitchen because yeah. someone will want to order a really expensive thing that's only in one dish that might be ordered like once a week, like once a, every couple of days, and then the thing goes bad. But you see these, I know we've talked about this before, the Gordon Ramsay's reality TV show is kind of, some of those are more staged, but it's not too far from what actually happens in some kitchens in some places who, that's part of why businesses in general are tough, and I think even restaurants above it, you think it's food, people got to eat. It should be easy to run a restaurant, but it really is not. <laughs> so small mistakes like this. With this one, every every carrot they they order, I think it's a dollar per carrot. Ninety five ninety five cents of that carrot is actually made it to the plate. If you go to a place and you go to eighty, that could be enough in a longer in after a couple of months to be those margins that kind of take you down from being a successful place or not. Yeah. Well, I always think of what Andrew Carnegie said, too, about take care of your pennies and your dollars will take care of themselves. And you see that mentality carried through on here, because like I say, I mean, it, and it, we'll get into it on the next dish, but it's the same thing with the beets. Like, you know, you can scoop out balls and stuff, but then you puree the rest, the remnants of the beets into something else. So you use it up because it's that or you feed it to staff for the meal, which is fine. But it's like you're not making money off that. You want to put it on a dish that you can charge money for. And then with um. Well, like, like, for example, at Bar Balloon with they would get whole like quarters of beef and the guy would break them down. But then the scraps, the trimmings and stuff, that's what got made into ground beef because that's stuff you can't serve on a plate in a nice restaurant. But then that's what you use that to feed the staff. So it's like it's stuff that you wouldn't serve to people who are paying good money, but like you still want to use up because it's like, you know, and then. With family meal, it's like okay, you can feed your staff, which they, which you have to do, but at the same time, um, it's not you're not giving them food that you should be making money off of either. Yeah, yeah. and this is another good thing with it. when you're cooking at home, when you start learning some of these little tricks of the trade or just little things that can add, understand sauces, understand things like this, because you often find someone will order a piece and then they'll use it for that main dish, and since it's going to go bad in their kitchen, they might throw it away. It's, that's something I also see in some in some kitchens when I've seen some people cook that yeah. it can be worked on, and also I can keep in mind, and, and the puree thing, that's a good idea, yeah. Just the scraps, find a way, just puree them, and yeah, that's, yeah. that's something.
I don't think I can I can think of adding already to just the basic cooking that I do. Yeah, yeah. just just thinking think in terms, especially at this level of like what's presentable on a plate versus what's practical. Cause it's like, you know, the, the little balls look nice on the plate, but like, you're not going to put scraps of vegetables on the plate, but if you can turn that into something that does look presentable. So you do, it, there's a little scoop, it's called a canal where it's just like, you sort of scoop it on the plate in that shape. Like that's a lot nicer than if you were just to like roast a piece of that carrot and throw it on, it would just, it would look <laughs> very, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and now with duck breast seems to be the most common, at least when we've come across duck in this entire series. Um, no, the cock of the cock was not duck. It was just chicken. And cock. Yeah. Uh, but it, do they really, you never really hear of like duck soup or duck noodle soup or like duck wings or like, uh, I, I personally like, like, like the backs. I like other parts of like, I'm personally someone who get the entire chicken and break it down and have different parts like in stews or different things. But duck breast seems to be like the main thing. So yeah. again, when they when they get this, would they order just the duck breast? These restaurants, or would they order the whole bird, and what happens? So it depends on the place. Like when I, I forget what happened here, but I know when I worked at Eddie and the Wolf, we would actually get whole ducks, and it, it was actually ducks are actually a very useful animal because what you would do is, um, I used to break them down. You, what you do is you cut off the duck breast off the whole animal, and then mm -hmm. you cut off the legs as well, and then you take. There's a lot of like excess fat because the ducks are very fatty animal, and what you do is you would. Um, You'd cut off the breasts, you'd cut off the legs, um, you take all this excess fat, like put it in one thing, and what you would do is you'd actually render the duck fat down. Because think of when the duck fat is in its natural state, it's almost like chicken skin, but a little thinner. But what you do is you'd put it with a little bit of water on the stove and you would gradually melt it down. And then when it cooled, it looked like duck fat, like you get in a container. And then what we did was the legs we um, confit, so it's, you figure, cure them for like a certain amount of time. You simmer them in their own fat, cool them down. They simmer and cool in their own fat. You use those. And then the breast, you just sear and serve. And then um, the bones you typically made into stock. So what you would do is you would um, put the bones in a pot, of course, vegetables, aromatics, and other things, strain that off. That would um, usually, and that would either become a sauce or a stock that was used for something else. So again, same thing, you use the whole product. And then the duck fat that you um, rendered down, that's what you would make your confit with. So. I was trying to find it, but like when I was at Eddie and the Wolf, that was a duck dish that we had was there was a duck breast, but then there was also duck confit, which we made in-house. And then the duck jus was based off the stock. And then there was, um, I'm trying to think what else. Yeah, so there was the breast, the le the leg, the fat was rendered down, and the bones were made into stock. So you used the whole thing. I think I think here, if I remember correctly, it was a similar process, but I didn't, uh, I wasn't involved in it, so I didn't notice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, now this would be stuff that would probably be done like before the, the restaurant opens or like right after and things like that, right? Well, well, the challenge with seasonal, I think I might have mentioned before, was that it was one crew for lunch and dinner. So you actually had to prep while you were doing lunch, which was kind of annoying. And like we used to always joke about that, how like I was like, I would love to have like zero for lunch and like a full house for dinner because then you have plenty of time <laughs> to get everything done. But it was tough, especially during the holidays, because it was like you get a busy lunch and then you have a busy dinner. So you're trying to get your prep done for dinner while you have lunch and then you have an even busier service at night. So it's just like you it was so hard to stay on top. Like I remember there were times where I was coming in like really early in the morning because I'm just like, I don't have time to you know do all this. But um, they say that's common in European kitchens, though, a separate uh, sorry, same crew for lunch and dinner. A lot of other kitchens like bar balloon and others it was like am pm shift like it's like you come in you know you prep you come in really early prep for lunch service do lunch service other people come in afternoon prep for dinner and then they work dinner but this it was just one crew like all day uh. yeah yeah that's that's to me one of the suggestions of why it's, it's good to to get to know more of your, your animals i know in the united states of america apparently they say that if you take out what was it do you take out pork beef and there's some other animal if you take that out there's no inflation there's almost no negligible of inflation chicken breasts and so for me this it, this is this, this seems to apply everywhere that i've been everywhere that i've been where you can get the full bird it's much much cheaper to do that it's almost half half cheap like yeah it's almost 50 percent off if you get it yourself and then you break it down yourself yet people i guess there's something also with convenience and people not knowing and yeah. yeah, you do like cost benefit analysis in your mind. Like if you have a job that you're earning like thirty dollars an hour, then spending even an hour at home, I get when people do that. But for me, I like getting that getting the full bird. Then as you mentioned, there's many different things you can do with the other parts of the birds in different ways. That yeah. And like for me, a, a typical thing that I do if I'm cooking meats, I like getting the meat. you trim the fats off. I like frying meat in in its fat. Or if I'm cooking chicken. Yeah. 
even if I'm doing like a stew, I normally fry it first before. If I'm doing it in the oven, sometimes I'll fry it first. So you put the, the skin, you let that render down so the chicken fat, so what's being cooked into it. So yeah, it's, it's just something that I've mentioned before and probably will mention occasionally when these come up. But yeah, that's, again, uh, this has been, eh, I mean, these talks are always good, but a lot of good info with you actually having the experience in behind the kitchen on, on this specific one. Yeah. And like I say, um, duck confit, I, I, I've probably said some version of this, but, but duck confit is like, true confit because confit means something classically simmered and cooled in its own fat so with the duck mm -hmm. confit you're actually taking fat even from that individual duck and then the legs the legs you cure their spices there's usually like you know salt um bay leaf uh thyme there's all this stuff it usually cures for like a day or something and then the next day you put it in a pan with the fat over top and then it just like slowly cooks in that and then like once the meat falls apart, you pull the pan out of the oven, you let it cool, but it cools in the own fat. And then you like take a glove, put it on your hand, uh, pull out the duck meat, and then you usually cook that duck as is. Like um, at Eddie and the Wolf, we actually finished the comfy duck leg in a broiler, so it's like crispy again. Um, you can take the meat, you can shred it, you can put that in things. But duck confit is true confit because it's fat from that animal, whereas like people throw around confit like you know, shallot confit, strawberry confit. It's mm -hmm. like, you know, I mean, those those things don't actually have their own fat, but it's kind of a play on that concept. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, uh. What fats do they normally use? And that's just yeah, it's different, probably different. Uh, well, well, like I say, classically it's a fat. It's classically it's an animal, and it's fat from that animal. But like now they'll like they'll use oil. Like like there's like a tomato confit. They'll do olive oil or things like that. You know. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. Anything else to add on this? Ah, uh, no, that's good. Okay. So now we'll go to. Um, Anton Brust, Anton Brust. Anton Brust. I think you're you're Anton. saying it in a French way, Anton. Yeah. yeah all over the place. Okay, Anton and Brust. Anton Brust. Yep. And yeah, Anton Brust. Yep. We just. We, I just said it. I just said it and completely forgot. It went out of my mind. Why? Just think like <laughs> think like think like Ant from Lord of the Rings. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Anton. Yeah. But but I, I mean we were just talking about it before and we, the discussion it just completely voided from my mind. So Anton mm -hmm. Bruce. Anton Bruce, which yep. is again another seeded duck breast with black cherry farrow, cherries, hazelnut, almond powder, beet puree, and pickled beets. And again, that's continuing the, the typical thing that we've seen in this restaurant is is different takes on a generally same kind of dish and a similar kind of pl plating. And is this in part because you had the three people working together, the owners, they're all kind of involved. So whether you try different things or is this something that's... <laughs> that, that's relatively commonly done at, at uh, restaurants of this sort, especially when you have a seasonal one like this. Well, you'll notice with certain chefs, they have certain styles of doing things. So several of these were Frederick's dishes. Uh, he was the first chef, the Swedish guy. And um, he preferred like this style of plating and like some of these components. So like he, if you notice the dishes that look kind of similar, it's like those are his dishes, but he would tweak the components based on the season, what's available and all this. So like, uh, carrots and beets are actually commonly prepared with duck. I'm not sure the history behind that, but it's common. So, and the last one that that's more of like a springtime thing. This was more of like a fall, uh, winter preparation. So, um, same thing, you know, seared duck, uh, black, uh, cherry farrow. So what it is, is he actually made, um, farrow the grain, but he cooked it with cherry juice instead of carrots. Um, the cherries are actually, uh, cherries cooked in their own juice. You can see a little half of one, um, up close here. Um, Hazelnut almond powder. It was almond oil, but there were actually toasted hazelnuts that were crushed up and thrown in. Uh, beet puree. Um, you know, you can tell roasted beets. You puree them, you know, mix it. I think there was a little purple mustard in there. Um, just, you know, put it on the plate. And then the pickled beets, if you remember the first dish, the amuse-bouche, uh, beets cut very thin on a deli slicer and then uh, pour pickling liquid over top so it's florets. And then you just sort of take tweezers and sort of like stick them in a thing so it looks like a little flower on the plate. Um, so yeah, it's uh, beets and cherries are common. Uh, beet and duck is common. So it's just like a play on that. And then again, you have the textures, the grains, the puree, the powder, etc. Yeah. yeah, interesting. Yeah, this one, especially with the with the ducks, kind of more redder than bread or meat, kind of look. Mm -hmm. It looks like it would be a good play together with the, the redness of the beet, kind of uh, working together in that. Yeah. So it's a much darker. You know, I guess yeah, it's a bit darker of a plate. You have the yeah. green and the orange, the lighter orange, but here it's mostly mostly reds and then uh, some greens in there. Which one did you prefer by, between these two? If, if you had one, you prefer. That's a good question, actually, because I, lo I love all the ingredients on each one. But like, I think I think in terms of seasonality, like the first one, this the last one's a little like I think it's it, they each one plays well to each season because I feel like springtime, it's like lighter, brighter stuff. And then like 
fall and winter it's more like root vegetables and darker stuff so i feel like each one sort of plays to that i don't know that i prefer one over the other but i think each time of year each one works pretty well um it's interesting though because I was, I was just thinking like i think they did duck all year but i know some places um they don't even like to do duck in springtime because they feel like it's a fattier animal so it's more like mm -hmm. a heartier dish so like Certain French places will do chicken and other like lighter meats and fall and winter they do duck. I mean, I can eat duck like all the time. I don't really care, but I mean yeah. some people are some people are sticklers for that. So uh. Yeah. Uh, so the black cherry farrow, uh he's all, it's in the powder again. Is this also the powder as you mentioned? It was yeah, it was in this one when you talked about you know, there's a charcoal powder or there's was, there was some other powder before we said it kind of breaks apart when you put it in your mouth. Like yeah. you, so oil in. So all the powders here, they're based off tapioca uh, starch, which you can buy. I think you can get it even off of Amazon. And what you do is you can pour an oil into it. And the idea is that it can withhold the oil, but it'll stay in powder form. I mean, obviously, to a certain point, if you put too much oil, it'd be too much. But the idea is that it stays in powder form. And then when you bite into it, it dissolves in your mouth and you get the flavor of the oil. So horseradish powder, almond powder, almond hazelnut powder, all these different things, they're all based off that same, the same component, but different things are added so they have the flavor. And it's just, I mean... The powder itself doesn't have much flavor. It's more of a texture thing. It's a way to introduce those flavors, but in a more interesting way. Whereas, like, again, you're not just going to put ash on the plate or you're not going to put an oil on the plate. Like, you want to make it um, create an interesting texture. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah as we mentioned, it's a different texture, a different mouthfeel, it's a different flavor yeah. of the gland together. You know, you can you can cut a piece of the of the you're not just going to get that duck breast and then <laughs> swallow it whole. Yeah. You know, you cut a piece off and you dip it, you try it together with maybe one, you try it with one of the beet sheets. With a bit of the powder on it, you see how that goes. Or maybe you put a bit of the powder in the puree, and then you try another piece of. So you get to the different kind of things, different kind of experiences from the same dish. And yeah. there's something I was born in France, and no, yeah, I was born in France, and my mom used to say this like French style thing. I don't know if it's French cuisine and necessarily where you're supposed to clean off your plate, but it's just been a, a, a. I don't know why she called it French style. Actually, I don't know if that's something that you've heard before. But um, with some of these, like. I, I don't know if you're, if you're watching people's plates, like when you're when you're cleaning the tables and things like that. How many of these things? I know sometimes the greens and microgreens are kind of garnish. It's not necessarily to be eaten, but how many on average do people clear the plates or do they leave things? Did somebody like on average something like this would they just find people mostly just eating the meat by itself and then leaving the things on the side? Or I'm sure this thought process going in in the back of the kitchen like we need to have the right amount of accompaniment so there's a general idea of how it should kind of be eaten you don't have to do it but i'm thinking they have something like that in mind well so the thing is chefs were always big on especially at culinary school they always talked about they use the term non-functional garnish how they said to avoid that like only put things on the plate that can be eaten because what's that what happens sometimes with microgreens is certain people would put them on the side not eat them other people would ask can you eat them and we'd be like oh yeah of course and some of these have specific flavors like there was like tangerine greens there's different flavors of mint there's like you know thai bait micro thai Base, all these things so if someone asks can i eat this of course yeah you can everything on the plate's edible um i know renee the german chef he was big on certain um flowers that like they looked really nice on the plate but you could eat them as well because that's deliberate because if you have something that looks nice on the plate but you can't eat it i mean you know you don't want a person eating the wrong thing so it's like you make it foolproof yeah. then if someone just says i don't want to eat this it's like that's fine you don't have to but i, I think most people did and, you know some people would pick them off and put them on the side but i think I think they may not understand that you can eat this or they just, I don't know, some people just don't like it for whatever reason. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And I think with that, if you're done, we can transition to the last one and then we'll still yeah. like, uh, it will still have a lot of very functional dishes <laughs> after yeah. this one. Yeah. But I think we'll, this will be the, our penultimate one for this part of the series. Sure. And uh, I, I think, I think I know what this one is. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Uh, the next one here, we have lamb. Now, would that yep. be a, would they last on the M lamb? No, it's so, just okay. it's just lamb. It's just like English. Yeah. It's just lamb. So the the, yeah. the the double M just goes a lamb sound. Yeah, yeah. Ah, seems kind of boring. Yeah. I want them like lamb, uh. <laughs> like stick on the m <laughs> lamb. And this is lamb, um, celery root puree, roasted cipollini onions, and micro mustard grains. Sure. So, um, so, so lamb is just, um, I forget which part it was seared. You could tell it's medium rare here. Um, the sweet bread's the same preparation as above. I'm not going to go through it all again here, but it was the one that was, uh, with the 
Earl Grey tea, salt, cherry, vinaigrette. If you want to watch the previous part, I explain how this was made. Uh, celery root puree that's underneath. Uh, roasted chipolini onions, the little onions that are just uh, seared. And then some micro mustard greens. Um, the micro mustard greens actually taste like they sound, so that adds flavor to it as well. <laughs> um, this, was, this was a springtime dish, if I recall. Like I say, lamb's typically in season around springtime, so this is when this was on the menu. Yeah. All right. Yeah, this seems like uh, what was the? I'm trying to scroll back up. There was there was some dishes that seemed to be plated in the same kind of well, yeah the the Schweiner Schweinebock. It seems to be yeah. the same kind of plating. It's like a line, a tower yeah. of sorts, a, a laid down tower of 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 meaty goodness and things like that. But yeah, I, is you know is that? Hmm. Yeah, I think with some of. Now I'm trying to wonder when these things were the first developed, like how many of these playthings and things like this are things that you'd have maybe found in the older courts? Because like, of course some of these things are more current kinds of creations. Like this 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 idea of the tower line type thing, it seems to be a, a rather common plating uh, thing. Do you know anything about that history or the, the so reasoning? So a lot of the dishes that you see like this were dishes that Frederick, the Swedish chef, put on the menu. Um, I don't know an exact if there was an exact story behind that. If I think he just preferred that style of plating. Like, for example, if you remember with the pork bellies, there were a few ones that were in the lines like that. That was his thing. But then the other chef, Rene, did the one with the crostini where it was just in the middle. So I guess it was just their style, their background. They preferred plating each way. I'm not really sure if it's just preference or restaurants he worked in or I, I don't know it could have been a few different things i never really asked uh. okay uh. yeah and here with the sweetbreads which different animals they is it just most of the hooved animals they have the sweetbreads from is they normally like is it normally a specific animal typically like, uh yeah. typically veal because like yeah i guess it depends on what they eat and their own biology this thing that you'd probably go and you probably wouldn't want a similar piece from a different animal i don't know but it's, it's also only in younger animals because they said with like the veal, they have it. Then when the animal grows up, it disappears because it serves a certain hormonal function okay. and then it just like disappears. So it's like you're not going to get sweetbreads from an adult cow. Uh, okay. Yeah. So we can get from like kids or like <laughs> not, 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 not kids here talking about the goat kids. Or the, yeah. Um, said the, the veal, uh, what's what's a, okay, a lamb? Is it a lamb? Oh yeah, okay. Um, hmm. Yeah, I don't really have too much to say on this. It's I, lamb is the state, so you'd say earth here and meat. So, uh, I guess yeah, most people in the United States of America have probably had some lamb here and there, but that, that's when you start going kind of off the reservation. Take something like beef <laughs> is normally the. Common thing. It's so weird. Like beef just seems to be the common thing, but then lamb is also there. But then goat. I'm really surprised as to why goat isn't as popular in the United States of America as it is in most of the rest of the world. And like goat is like. Almost as popular, if not more popular than beef here in Kenya. Yeah, it might it might just have to do with the traditions and like what people grew up eating and stuff. Because it's like, I mean, I don't think I even had much goat till like culinary school, and I remember having it in like when we were learning about Jamaican food. Um, I think you know that was the curry goat. I know like Trinidad, that's big because they have a lot of Indian influence as well. Um, I'm trying to think. I mean, I had yeah, we had goat with a casamono in that presentation. I haven't. I don't know. I just it's not something I've had a lot of i don't know again it might it might just be like what's popular what's available i mean there's plenty of it available i don't know it's just not popular here for whatever reason uh. now on something like this, this with the with the lamb were you able to say okay if you wanted it like done well done or was it a certain way that they decided this is how they serve it, it it's one of the typically the way it works with a lot of these meats is that it's chef recommends medium rare. However, we can do it a little less or a little more if you'd prefer, but the chef recommends that. Um, like for example, with duck, if you cook, if you cook duck well, it tastes almost metallic, I guess, cause there's a lot of iron in it. So it's like, it's not pleasant. I mean, you can eat it that way. I wouldn't recommend it. Um, similar thing with lamb. So the thing with lamb is, remember, I think I had mentioned in a previous discussion how the reason a lot of people served mint with lamb is because originally they ate mut mutton, which is adult sheep, and mutton is super strong. So it's yes. like you basically you basically put mint to drown out the flavor. But they're making the point that because lamb's milder, it's like you don't need something to drown out the flavor. You want it something to complement it. And if lamb is more like rare, medium rare, it's definitely more delicate. Now, if you cook it well, you'll, you will get that stronger flavor. But um, it's not going to cook as strong as an adult sheep, though. Yeah, that might be something I might look into because the sweetbreads, as you're saying, because even just cooking the meat itself, the adult mutton, yeah. it's a strong, astringent smell coming off of yeah. it. It is, it is, it is its own creature. 
Yeah. Goat has its own smell too, but I really like the smell of goat. It's, it goat's uh-huh. just amazing. <laughs> yeah. It could also just be the, the raising of the animal. Yeah, some might not be location-wise and things, but also I'm thinking the goats are normally slimmer animals. They're they're more uh, stringy, so it's you're not going to get as much meat off of your average goat as your average uh, uh, average um, as your average. I guess with the mutton, they're only eating them as as lambs. So. I'm trying to think, okay, there's pork. Yeah, pork, of course, are, are larger animals. But those are kind of the only, like, little hooved type of things. I, I'm, I'm looking towards the future where people, like, farm, or maybe, like, more deer becomes more common. I know venison, if you're living in more, like, the rural areas in the United States of America, is more common. But that's something that they could probably start doing in Africa. Start figuring out how to do more, like, privately owned preserves where you can have, like, impala or, like, gazelles and things like that where it's hunted. Because... I know some people, there definitely is concern for poachers and things like this, but you look at the actual countries where they have private land, privately owned things, in general, just look, look at the animals in the world that humans have private ownership over, and those animals have thrived. You're talking chickens, you're talking cows, you're talking even horses back when they were more used. Like These are animals that used to be out in the wild at much lower numbers in some cases, and now just billions of them, <laughs> because you actually having people to find a way to profit from them. And they, I think that's the future type of way, have actual people be allowed to farm elephants, where somebody's invested in taking care of elephants, and making sure the elephants have their healthy food and things like that. And yes, you see that with some industry people, oh, we don't want like farm raised. You're probably not going to see to mean like farm raised elephants in that sense. I'm not talking like zoos and things like that. But um, okay, we've been having some internet issues and I was mentioning something, I hope the rant was caught, <laughs> just talking about different private ownership of humans being able to benefit from the actual animals. And then you have like a, a animal and animal relationship between human animals and the animals that we eat. And you see this out in nature as well. There's actual animals that not necessarily directly farm them in the higher levels that we do it, but there's symbiotic relationships with other animals where it's like, yes, the, we understand as a prey, but they kind of benefit from each other. I'm trying to think of, there's, there's actual animals that take other animals and put them onto other animals in order to help clean themselves. But I guess in those like remora eels, no oh, wait, remora eels. There's like some remora. Remora. You're thinking of remoras. Remoras. Yeah. That's what you're thinking yeah. of. Yes. Yeah. They clean animals, but I guess those animals don't necessarily eat those things. So maybe we are we are a bit different in that sense where we can prey on so many other things. As I mentioned with the flea divers or us finding different kinds of foods and vegetables and things like that to eat, but. But I, I think I'm seeing that happening in the future as, as something that, that will that will occur. Well, that's also like those birds that sit on top of hippos and other animals. Or um, yes. I think, what is it, uh, capybaras? I think they say that's why all those birds sit on them. They say, like, don't pet them because they have all these bugs and things, but the birds eat them off. So, yeah, things like that, yeah. 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 Okay. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, anything else you want to say about this? No, I think that's good. Okay. So I think with this one, we have come to the end of this part. Uh, should be up. And we're recording this on, on a Monday as we have our regular recordings. We're working on a few other series as well. And we have some plots and some plans coming up together that we'll have, I think, some interesting things to announce. And uh, we still also have our more political conversations and other things that we're interested in. But we're trying to build this platform up. And I've been really enjoying it and having these talks with Stephen for over different topics for now going on almost five years now. Started, I think yeah. the first one was 2017. But um, this is a little thing that we're doing together and we shall continue doing it for some time. Uh, as you, again, thanks, Stephen. There's a lot of extra info with this one. There's already a lot of info when you just talk about the foods itself, but then giving us a little behind the scenes with working at Season Island. There's other yeah. restaurants he's worked at that will also be coming up in this. So anything else you want to say about this section? But now we're finally past halfway of the list, so at least two more parts. No, I mean, you know, another good discussion. I enjoyed it. I mean, hopefully everyone learned some things watching this. And uh, again, I mean, as we develop this as well as our other series, if anyone else wants to come on and talk about other types of food or talk about this stuff more in depth or other things, I mean, I'm happy to take it. Uh. Yeah, most definitely. And unfortunately, as you mentioned, this is one that has been closed. Uh, yeah. If you have heard guys, gals, and everything else in between, have heard of different Austrian places or uh, with similar food like this, let us know in the comments. It doesn't happen in New York City anywhere else because 
this is the internet. These things are getting far and wide, and there might be other people who are trying things. One thing that would be really cool, I think, once we get this platform set up, get, get the location, would be just to have dishes that we have here, and then we'll be trying making them ourselves. And y'all out there can also like see some things and like, oh, we tried making this at home or stuff like that. Or maybe you run a restaurant, you'd be like, oh, you saw something here, and then you decided to try it out in your restaurant. And I think we can probably even get to a point where we get like submissions of people putting dishes in. We get yeah. to discuss those things. I don't know. It, it's this is something that I think has has a lot of growth potential and uh, definitely and uh, a lot of possibility. I, I, I we'll probably won't get tired of talking about food. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, never, never for um, me. <laughs> okay, so anything else? <laughs> okay, you said the owners of Seasonal. You have mentioned this in other series. What are they doing right now for anybody who's interested in seeing the food from here? If they want to know more about these, these people. So Eddie and Wolfgang no longer work together. I remember. Towards the end of Eddie and the Wolf, I think Wolfgang was actually bought out of the company. I don't know exactly what happened, but I guess he like was bought out and kind of went off on his own. Uh, last I heard he was in Long Island. I heard he was going to open or did open something there. I don't know what happened with that. Um, Eddie still has... As far as I know, he still does catering at the German house. Now, the German house is not a public restaurant. It's a restaurant in the German embassy for people who are there. They, um, so he he runs that, and then also he runs Schilling, which is the place near the um, World Trade Center. Um Aside from that, I don't know. He was talking about doing other things, but I don't know if any of it materialized or is in the work. Or I, I, I've been meaning to go into Schilling again. I haven't been in touch with them in some time, but sometime soon, sure. Something I'll try to remember to be adding, because as you mentioned, if you want to know more about seasonal, um, in the first one, we had, a, I think it was the like first 45 minutes, we're just talking about the, the restaurant or even more than that. So you can definitely go check that out if you're interested in more information about it. But um, sure. otherwise, you got anything else to say to the peoples? Nope. Another good discussion. Yep. Okay. Well, Stephen, stay on for after we're done. But for me, that's uh, it's done with part three of the seasonal, seasonal and vine bar, and two more, at least two more to come. A lot more on the channel. We just posted the second part today as we're recording. So, you, most definitely, if you've heard this, you will have at least this is part thirteen in the URL where you can see him series. <laughs> <laughs> with this your dish we've talked about at least four different restaurants before this one so there's a lot of content out there for y'all to get and if you listen to this months later they will all we, we have we're planning on doing a lot more so there will be also content there but yeah sure all right, all right cool goodbye goodbye everyone thank you <laughs>